And we're broadcasting. All right. I think we're live. It's Wednesday, July 21st, 2021. Soon to be 22. It is almost Christmas. Wow. It's going so fast. I mean, it's almost August. It's incredible. I don't know where time goes. I mean, seriously, it's so busy. We have a great show today. The weather looks very nice outside as I look through my windows. And I see you all. I am surrounded by Digital 360 Summit speakers. And so is John Butler in August 31st to September 2nd. It should be a great time. Um, looking forward to it. John, would you like to kick us off with some nice yes. music? A new man, Bojangus, and he danced for you. In one of shoes, silver hair, baggy pants, you know. The wall saw shoes. He jumped so high, he jumped so high. Then he lightly touched down. How you doing, Andres? I'm doing great, sir. Thank you for that inspiration. It's always nice to hear you play. And uh, we have, again, a lovely, lovely day. Llewellyn, how are you, sir, today? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in Washington, D.C. Actually, I'm sitting in what they call the writer's room at the Cosmos Club. Uh, oh, wow. And, Exciting. That's why I, hence the background is, is not indigenous. But I want to tell you something. Both you and Johnny have the same background. And at a glance, it doesn't look like a bunch of photographs. It looks like a bar. It's very below a line, um, which is fine with me. I mean, very agreeable, uh, superior, probably. Yeah, well, you know, this, this is the background of what 2019 looked like at the Digital 360 Summit. And it was a lovely affair to turn into a major, major event that's coming up now, August 31st, again, to September 2nd. And uh, hopefully you all will be joining us. I'm actually remiss to uh, say that I'm going to invite Carl to show up and uh, we'll figure it out in what capacity he shows up. Hopefully a lot of Austin energy people will be there along with many others. But um, Carl, how are you today, sir? Uh, I'm doing wonderful, Andres. Good to see everyone. Thanks for the for the music, John. Uh, coming from you, I guess, live in my home in Austin. So beautiful weather. Uh, and then the featured painting is from my mother that I'm showcasing in the back and here. My awesome. Awesome. Oh, very good. Very nice. Well, for all of those that um, wonder about uh, Carl's uh, accolades, he's actually the manager of electric vehicles and emerging technologies at Austin Energy. That sounds like a, kind of like a 007 license to kill. He can get involved in all kinds of amazing things. And I'm sure we're going to find out about a few. So we're happy to have him. Carl has been in Austin Energy for quite a while. And I actually had the privilege of uh, hiring Carl into the team back in the day. Uh, and he is, uh, he's been the interim CIO uh, a division manager of the program management office and a program manager and a project manager. So he was in the IT side of the household for a while. And then he's been running EVs and emerging technologies for a longer time now, I think. And prior to Austin Energy, Carl was a managing director at HP Services, a VP of consulting services at PNS, director of global projects and e-commerce at Capgemini, and he is a former captain at the highest rank in the U.S. Army, U.S. Corps of, of Engineers. Thank you for your service, sir. Essayons. <laughs> and Carl is also a Longhorn. He did get a Bachelor of Arts degree from the School of Business uh, at Macomb. So lo and behold, we keep getting surrounded by Longhorns. I just make invitations and they all happen to be Longhorns. How does that work, John Butler? 
Well, you know, what starts at Texas influences the world, changes the world as we try to make America, Texas perfect. <laughs> it is it's a, it's a great day in, in Austin, Texas. And Carl, I, I am a decorated Vietnam veteran myself. I won the bronze star for combat and valor that I'm proud of. But, you know, it's a lot going on in Austin. It's a lot going on in America. As we, the economy tries to come back, then the virus tries to come back. As we try to solve issues in Texas, then the Democrats get on an airplane and take off. As we try to open things, the mask might be coming back. So there's a lot of coming and goings in terms of the, the intellectual, how we think about things. Uh, we have a saying that is, is very complex. Well, we live in, in, a, in, a, in a society of complexity now at least when you turn on the television and uh, listen to the news. But otherwise, we are in Austin here, and it's a gorgeous day, and, and we're preparing for the future. Uh, we had the, um, some people went to space from, from West Texas, and the most important thing about that is we hope to get some economic development around there for that city out there, because it was just a, a one-stop gas station before they moved out there. <laughs> But you know, it's very, very interesting. The things that we've talked about is economy and is it coming back? And, and when you, I was talking to people this morning and, and they would say, well, you know, that virus is, is already back. And then there's the hostility, if you will, uh, directed toward people who have not taken the virus shot. And then there's the hostility because people would say, you cannot ask people, have they been vaccinated? Yeah, so I, was, yeah. I was speaking to a lady in a laboratory and, and she was really disturbed that it was against the quote law for them to ask people have, have they been vaccinated. Yeah. So it's some so, interesting times going on. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Luella, you know, from last week to this week, not much changes. The only great change is uh, inflation seems to be a, a tad more under control with the price of a uh, barrel of oil coming down $7 from last week, which is a good sign. But uh, what's your take on, on how are things? Are, are we, are we shall, shall we worry about COVID more or are things uh, somewhat under control? Uh, well, no, I don't think they're under control. I think that finally people have got the wind up, so to speak, and are getting vaccinated. Yesterday, my wife was over at CBS Shop. Come, come closer to the speaker. Uh, there were 30 people lined up at the chemist shop for shots. They hadn't seen that. People have finally got the message that if you don't get the shots, you may get the disease and you can have a very terrible death as a consequence. Uh, it's incredible and it's taken so long to get that message out. Overall, I think we're doing okay. I've never been as worried, or not this time around, that's pretentious of me to say, but never been so concerned about uh, uh, inflation as um, some people would be, because I think, uh, one, it's fairly inevitable, and two, we know the factors that are driving it. And interestingly, to this point in time, government borrowing is not one of those factors. The factors are the Broughton West, which is very serious, and we need to talk about that more, um, the price of oil and the fact that people are having to push up wages to get workers. Those are three inflation drivers that seem to have missed a lot of commentators. Um, I've come back to the situation in the West. I think my colleagues in the media have been remiss at not giving it more attention longer. This is the great horror that has been predicted to um, well, going back to the 1940s and the first ideas of building the so-called peripheral canal and other dramatic water works. Um, always California, and which is the most severely affected in long-term the largest problem, um, uh, has uh, dodged the bullet, if you will. But now we yeah. have a truck system it may last for many years. Yeah. And we're going to have problems with agriculture, problems with food supply for the whole nation. And of course, we're going to have recession in the West induced by the drought. Consequently, the recession will come east or some of the elements of the recession 
will be felt in the East. This is a huge thing, and it's not going to go away because a new calendar year rolls around next year. This could go on for years, and entirely also is full of challenges. Better water management, better agriculture, more, uh, more of the Israeli style of agriculture. I looked at their systems when I've been over there. And uh, we're going to have to have a new look at desalination uh, from both ends, both how to do it uh, on a large scale uh, with less energy uh, in the desalination process. And also, we're going to need entirely new technology as to how to get rid of the brine, the filthy stuff that is left after you've taken the fresh water out and you suddenly have a concentration of salt and every other unspeakable thing that was in that water. It then becomes a pollution problem. You don't just put it back in the ocean because it came out of the ocean. You have to really come up with a disposal system that spreads it over a very large area of the ocean, or you have created a pollution problem and a new set of environmental concerns. This is great for people like Johnny who imagine teams and new companies to deal with them, but for most people, it's going to be a period of hardship. And some of it will resemble what we had in the 1930s. It's great. And I'm glad to see finally newspapers like Washington Post. Uh, well, it sounds like our friend Llewellyn King is sounding the bell. Um, uh, it seems also that we are living in multiple Americas. So I'm curious, uh, Carl Puffin, as um, uh, someone at Austin Energy and, uh, you know, living through the journey of COVID and working from home for a while, uh, any lessons learned on uh, the utility side about COVID? Are we going back to everybody being in the office? Are we going to live in a hybrid time frame uh, going forward? Well, what say you? Well, thanks again for, first of all, for having me on the show. And, uh, you know, as Andres mentioned, you know, he, he hired me on to the city of Austin, Austin Energy. So when your ex-boss calls you and says, hey, I want you to do something, uh, especially when it's part of the Carvalho Mafia family, you know, you just accept. So uh, so I'm happy to be voluntold uh, to be here. Um, but yeah, I think... Here's my main takeaways about COVID as it relates to teleworking. I would say the culture of electric utilities in general, and Austin Energy is, is not the exception, has really been an, an in-office collaboration, face-to-face, -face, shaking hands, elbow-to-elbow -elbow type of culture. I think we had a significant part of the population as we started rolling out pilots for teleworking, which my team was an early adopter of, I think we saw some hesitation uh, from, from some of the, I don't know, traditional utility folks. And you see this newer generation saying, no, this is just how work is. Once the pandemic hit, we overcame so many barriers in a 24 hour period related to why we can't telework. It was the genie is now out of the bottle folks. For yeah. even when Andreas was there so many years ago, we had this vision that we had to have a paper timesheet where ink on it. And that was all the rules. And we had technology platforms and business requirements of how we're gonna change something as simple as that. Within 24 hours, we figured out how to do electric timesheets because we had to. And I think that's just kind of a great kind of how utilities are. When you have to do something, you have a lot of smart people and um, resources to make it happen. Um, so, the short term is we do have a, a, a new headquarters we'll be moving into, uh, but the guidance from the city manager as well as our general manager, Jackie, is safety is gonna trump everything and, and what people are comfortable with. And so we're continuing to see, to Lowen's comments, we're starting to see a rise up in this new variant. And I think the utility is gonna take that uh, very strongly. And I'd say lastly, what we've seen the organization as a whole can function very efficiently with a smart telework plan. Not every job, like, you know, you're not gonna telework a line worker. They gotta be out there, but there is a lot of functions, you know, billing and strategic functions and other type functions where we're seeing efficiency and productivity go up with a strong telework strategy. And so I see mm -hmm. the hybrid approach is what we're gonna go moving forward. 
And I will see and kind of be team specific on how much of a hybrid is that teleworking uh, versus being physically in an office. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it, and it seems, Carl, that also that, that somehow automation, which is always, you know, it's been a journey forever going on and every year gets better and better that, that somehow COVID has been an agent of accelerating all that, true or false? Without a doubt. And sometimes you just see a society, you need a major change to, you see this gradual accelerated change and then you see something kind of big happen. And then you see a lot more automation. Um, something I saw, not to this scale, but it kind of reminds me of that rapid acceleration is the Y2K. Remember Y2K and all the systems were gonna shut down. So I was in consulting at that time. And you know, part of our practice was the Y2K practice. We're the fifth largest technology consulting company in the world at that time. So we had a lot of different you know, fingers on the pulse and you just saw this big ramp up in accelerating new technologies, new client server technologies, because that was the driver to let's not invest anymore in this kind of old technology. A lot of it was associated with mainframes. Also at the same time, we saw the boom of e-commerce. Companies realized to be competitive, you also had to have a sales funnel on e-commerce. So that was my specialty for a while was leading an e-commerce practice. So that was the other big driver. Now we're seeing a pandemic pushing teleworking combined with, I think any company now to be competitive, especially with younger generations, you have to have a telework strategy or you're not gonna be competitive of getting new talent in because that momentum has shift of expectations of what a modern day workforce looks like. Right, right, very interesting. You know, as, Hi, you, know, as, 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 as you, as all of these things were happening, I was looking at some data that I am uh, incorporating into my class in uh, September, and I would just want to listen listen to it. I'm going to read it here. Have you seen what's happening with the EV charging company valuations? Uh, charge point EV charging, that's New York Stock Exchange. Market cap around $8 billion. Blink EV charging, NASDAQ, Blink. Uh, market cap around $1.4 billion. E EV go charging, NASDAQ market cap around 3.3 billion with an estimation that EV charging requirements for more, more than be investments of over 110 billion by 2030. Those kind of things were happening when the pandemic was ravaging us. Mm -hmm. and, and we really talked about the bifurcation and Llewellyn and I of the stock market doing well as opposed to the gig economy. And while everybody was really, really concerned with the pandemic, we've talked about here on the program, how innovation and creativity became off the scale. So I'm looking at these numbers for the valuations for these companies. I'm looking at the EV, uh, the future of EVs. And I'm, I'm hearing Llewellyn say that Companies will always come in. The entrepreneurs will all come in uh, because right now there are about 45,000 public charging stations in America for EVs. And I just wanted to know and just ask a question to, to Carl. How do, you, how do you deal with the valuation with the new companies that's coming aboard with the EVs, with, with everything being charged up with 5G coming aboard? Uh, do you guys talk about these things at Austin Energy? Well, without a doubt, and I think there's some excellent points going on there. So one, we are seeing, you know, you're having the infrastructure correlating very directly to the rise of electric vehicles. And so in Austin, let's talk about Austin, there's about 300, 350 new EVs registered in our territory every month. Um, that doubled almost overnight when the Tesla 3 came out, it used to be around 100, 125. With the announcement of the Ford F1 Lightning, which within two weeks had 100,000 reservations, we're gonna double that again, I'm gonna expect. Wow. So there is a demand that's following the increase in EVs. And so the infrastructure is gonna to have to keep up. So even on, on a recent global study, and I'll, I'll, I'll cheat on my notes over here, mm -hmm. is a study that just came out this week from EY. They, they uh, did a study with 9,000 global participants. 41% said their next vehicle is going to be electric. 
that's up from 30% just a year ago. Wow. And so there's a lot of things kind of all coming together. And I would say the thing I'm looking for as an industry perspective, when you're seeing these new players, I really hope we get to the point of more open standards on this infrastructure. So you had the Biden plan that talked for to add 500,000 charging stations. You know, here in Austin Energy, my team manages a little over 1,100 level two and 30 DC fast stations. So that's how much we, we charge here. So that's a pretty significant infrastructure per capita. Uh, a recent study came out listed Austin. And one of the reasons was the infrastructure per capita as the third best city in the US to own an EV because they looked at the, the low cost of fuel and then the infrastructure per capita, uh, per capita and a few other things. So in Austin, I think we're doing pretty strong. But I think to really get to scale, we need to talk about open standards. We're starting to see, you know, the biggest network is Tesla and that's proprietary, it's just for Teslas. I mean, good for them, but it's also the majority of the, of the EVs on the road, so maybe it makes sense. But then you even have a newcomers like Rivian wanting to copy that model. Well, let's just make our DC fast, a lot at state and federal parks, Rivian only charging stations. So the what's next? So uh, I'm really hoping to push the industry to, we're not having to know which station you can plug in to get home or go along the highway that we truly yeah. have an open standard. And I think here in the US, the winner for DC fast will be CCS. That's kind of the made in America standard, if you will. And mm -hmm. we just need to uh, solidify on that so we can, we can move to scale. So, so, speaking, yeah. so speaking of that real quick, Carl, it, it clearly, as I said a little earlier, that you know we have the, all this uh, fair of paradox and dichotomies and the recovery of the economy. And some parts of the economy are completely on fire. You work on one of those parts of the economy where everything is on fire. And, and it seems like the EV world is truly, truly on fire outside of the space rocket race, which is probably the hottest thing on top of that. But what, what's your take on, for example, Southern California Edison planning to add 38,000 EV charging stations in the next five years, or all the things that are going on around, you know, the funding that is coming from the new administration, if the trillion, two, three trillion dollar package happens, and all the announcements of new products from all the car manufacturers. I mean, I, I, must, I must think that you have managed to convince every car company to give you a test drive sample for at least six months. So you must have a fleet of electric vehicles that you're testing on the grid every day, are you? Well, that was a lot of, lot of, that was a lot of information there, Andres, but I will first answer with anyone who works with battery technology and electric vehicles tries to avoid the on fire analogy. Um, we also don't say has gone viral. That's a new thing that we don't say uh, in even social media words. So, but yes, it's hot. Let's say it's hot, hot, hot. And I think you just listed some very smart strategic investments of utilities and others following the market. Mm -hmm. They see where the market is going. And then as utilities and other providers, I you have an opportunity. And, and so the best advice I give to other utilities or in the space is, show leadership now and be proactive. Otherwise the old adage is, you know, you're either at the table or on the table. If you're not being proactive now, you're gonna be on the table and then reacting to potential unintended consequences because you weren't showing leadership today. And right. so I think those are smart investments. They're following the market. And I'd say the last thing that, you know, regarding to infrastructure is on average, 80% of all charging here in Austin is close to 85%. It happens at home. So we focus a lot on this public infrastructure, level two DC fast and highways. But the reality is EVs for most customers is more like their phone. They come home, they plug it in, they go to bed. They never visit a gas station, or, you know, a gas station or an EV public charging station in their life of ownership. They don't even think about it. And, and they just plug in, they go to bed and they wake up and they go about their business. And so, so I think that's also a great opportunity for utilities to think about, about what EVs mean when they come to your territory. It's leveraging existing, very expensive infrastructure, transmission, distribution, et cetera. And then a lot of utilities, I'd say mistakenly call it new load. And new load means more of the same. 
but EVs has a completely different charging profile. And as you experts know, that makes a very big difference of when you charge and how much you charge. EVs naturally do a lot more charging at night. And here in Texas, it's especially important. It's not seasonally adjusted. So the 24 hour curve is different and people generally drive the same amount of miles if it's a nice day, a hot day, a cool day or cold day. So you just are, are using this underutilizes potential capacity of infrastructure. So it's all hitting the bottom line of utilities who are smart about accelerating the adoption of EVs in their territory. Right, Lou Yeah, I'd like to first uh, remind uh, Dr. Butler, my pupil, that um, he, uh, I've told him that the private companies would thrive with charging stations and that we should be a little careful about government or even if I might say so utilities trying to get into that market when new companies are usually better at new opportunities and that is happening. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's very interesting. I do think we need an open standard. We cannot have a bunch of different standards for charging. Um, and the history, I don't know whether the Tesla the Tesla can beat this, but the history of people who've tried to segregate a technology and keep it for project has not been that good, whether it's General Electric with a boiling water reactor or the CompuGraphic typesetting company, where they thought they could be proprietorial about the interface with their client, with the public, and it didn't work that well. General Electric had a long history of it, always trying to have engineer a difference in their approach to a common market. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work. But I think the standard is very important. I think it's, uh, I think mostly uh, commercial companies working in conjunction with utilities and local government because the use of parking meters, parking spaces, even on street parking as charging points and uh, will need some political collaboration. But uh, it's a very exciting time. And I think the, the speed at which uh, electric vehicles are going to multiply is going to be, uh, in, sense, in a sense, uh, comparable with air conditioning in the 40s and 50s, especially the 50s, uh, when it just swept the country. Utility demand was going up 7.5% uh, load uh, demand. Uh, so we might see something very dramatic happening. So Carl, real quick, how many electric vehicles in Austin now? We're right about at 15,000. 15,000. So if you remember one of my speeches and that we used to talk about how many electric vehicles would it take to, to uh, be able to uh, store the energy produced by Austin Energy in one hour, right? And so at 100 kilowatt hour batteries, that would be 30,000 vehicles roughly. Uh, so we're almost there for one hour. Uh, and there are roughly, you know, uh, one and a half million vehicles registered in Travis County. So it is going to happen. Uh, so what is the utility finally doing, if any, uh, the Shine Project and other things about modeling or planning the possibility of managing all those vehicles someday? Uh, well, there's a few things so, that we're doing. And when you're looking at managing charging or what we call EV grid integration, there is a couple strategies utility can look at. One is do nothing. You know, you always have to say do nothing. And there are some natural benefits uh, in doing nothing with how charging naturally happens most at night and at home. The most popular way people charge today in Austin is a level one outlet. So, you know, that's one KW. So that's not a lot. It's a, what we call a trickle charge equivalent of plugging in a wall, a, a hairdryer and a wall outlet. I mean, a level one, I'm sorry, it's just um, electric utility speak for wall, wall socket. So, you know, if someone asked me how many charging stations are in Austin, the answer is probably, I don't know, hundred million because every single socket can be an EV charging station. Right. Um, uh, so you can do nothing. You can do kind of a one way manage of one people charge. So that is falls under what would be a demand response program. So historically, we did an ARPA E grant. That's a Department of Energy Innovation grant around treating it much like we do air conditioning load and click it off. Uh, but what we found in that pilot is when people get a little warm, a certain percentage of people will opt out of that demand response program. They'll just turn it up because because they you know they feel a little warm and they cooled off. They don't care what's happening in the grid and whatnot. That's just customer behavior. Um, 
with the EV charging, we had 0.0 opt-outs. So people are much more comfortable as long as it's available in the morning to, to you know, let you have that loads more flexible than the traditional way utilities look at as air conditioning. And then you have vehicle to grid. So uh, uh, Andres mentioned uh, Shines. So that is our virtual power plant using mostly PV so solar and stationary storage, grid, commercial, and residential assets. And it includes a 10 kW bi-directional flow vehicle to grid as part of that ecosystem as part of the aggregated residential storage load uh, connected to rooftop solar. And what we found is this is technically it's very feasible and it works quite well. It's not the products aren't there to scale yet. They're too expensive. They're too bulky and even a little too loud from a decibel level to be really a, a true residential application. But it's close. We're already seeing technologies in Japan, which are already hitting a lot of those metrics. And so I would say as a utility, if it's not part of your strategy, if you look at any projection, I'll, I'll pick on Bloomberg New Energy Finance, over 80% of all batteries are gonna have wheels attached to them in the near future. 20% will be laptops and stationary storage systems and anything else you wanna be. So you would be ignoring 80% of the batteries that are gonna exist in your territory anyway, whether you like it or not. So why not be proactive with it? And then I'd say the other unique thing is batteries with wheels attached to them, e.g. EVs, is a sunk cost to the consumer. They've already spent that money to, to drive them around. It's already baked in the cost. So now you have this platform, which is very little additional expense to the customer compared to stationary storage that you can potentially uh, manipulate and integrate. You're also having companies being very savvy I'd say one of the best EV press releases I've ever seen in my life. And I, I managed, we're on our 10 year anniversary. I got to co-found this team, Electric Vehicles Merging Technologies. And my life has just been a few months ago with the Ford F-150 Lightning. They really know their buyer. They talk about torque and power. They don't even mention climate on their three page thing. That's not the focus of what they're doing. And they're talking about, hey, use this truck to power your work site or your home. And they have a picture of that truck lights on powering the home and everyone else is dark. And so that starts getting to people's heads. And if you look at the technical capabilities, it is true. You could have a, a Ford F-150 Lightning power a typical home for days. Um, they're estimating, because Ford hasn't released the specs, but they're estimating the, the longer range Ford clocks in around 170 kilowatt hours. That is a huge battery that's sitting in your, your parking lot or driveway. To put that size in perspective, a fully kitted out Tesla Powerwall weighs in around 10 kilowatt hours. And they're saying that's the backup power for your home. So now you're having something 17 times, 15 times bigger than one you know, Tesla Powerwall. So I would say the opportunities are too great to ignore. The technology is moving very quickly in a synergistic manner with a lot of other, other technologies. And, um, you know, regarding EVs on the grid, I look at it as much more as an opportunity to stabilize and enhance the grid in a lot of ways, not as a risk, because based on the nascent, how, how the technology works, not as another, well, how can we afford to put, you know, all this new load, because it's batteries, and that is, by its very nature, there is a lot more opportunity, we just need to manage the risk as a utility. Well, I'd like to ask a question, I would like to ask, what is the and what is the integration? I mean, you're integrating this, uh, how is it going to affect microgrids? We're integrating those into the power system. And then you've got this new dimension of electric vehicles as part of the battery backup of the system. How will microgrids adjust to that? And where will EVs fit in their structure? Yeah, that's a good point. So I would say for commercial adoption, it's really about vehicle to home. It's not about vehicle to grid at this point. Um, fleets uh, have a lot more applications due to more batteries and a lot more oversight and management of when those vehicles are in the depot and when they're about. about. So we're working with a few, to include our own city fleet is under a fleet electrification plan. And we're also, also working with our local transit authority, Cap Metro to electrify their buses as well as others. So I would say the early adopters will be fleet and working with fleet managers and their interest in microgrid technologies for various reasons, uh, mostly around reliability. 
but there's also some financial incentives uh, that under the ERCOT rules, which was a big part of Shines, was to develop business models. So we looked at a lot of different business models, not only business models for direct utility control, but also business models for third-party aggregators who participated in Shines, and also business models for autonomous controls, fire and forget. And so for a commercial um, uh, client, they have something called demand charges. So the number one value proposition, we, we looked at 19. So we created something called the Distributed Energy Resource Value Will. And we field tested six, what we thought were the top six. The number one that came out from, from that re research and shines for commercial operators is demand charge reduction. For the utility, a lot of it is under our transmission charge reduction called 4CP. But so you'd have a commercial fleet who they wanna lower their overall utility bill they could participate in demand charge reduction, aggregate that fleet during key times, especially if you're starting to see the market go up and, and we're starting to see, starting to go into those emergency alerts from ERCOT, they could participate in that vehicle to grid and really once again, draw value out of those batteries, which normally if it's internal combustion engine, just be sitting there collecting dust. But now that it has batteries, that's something of value to the grid, to the utility and to the customer. Well, Carl, this is very interesting from the history of business and the history of business models. We know if we could magically dig up the streets in Austin, Texas, uh, in front of the Capitol, and et cetera, it's all electric. All the buses were electric. Uh, the the streetcars were electric. In New Orleans, the, the poles went from the streetcars to the electric poles, right? Everything was electric. It was electrified. What's different in terms of the business model is now all of a sudden the Ford F-150 is a microgrid in a lot of ways. And so it's kind of back to the future where mm, every unit as measured by homes could become you know, independently in terms of uh, running their own electricity and then the load from their, from their houses. So my question is, is a simple one. If we go back and you look at your data from the 1920s, 1890s, when everything was electric in Austin, and then we move forward today where we have, in your words, microgrids on wheels. So the F-150 is not just where we like to tailgate, you know, to run your tailgate party all night at, at a football game, but all of a sudden it's a buying point for all, all consumers to have not only a, hmm, a Tesla, but maybe an f so how, how how does the math change for you guys? Because this is not the first go around with, with, with the electric stuff when it comes to buses and et cetera. So so if you lay it on lay it out on a, on, a, on a spreadsheet and ask the question, what's the, who would be the con contributors to the grid in the future? A grid would be on wheels. Uh, people will run up and down the highway. Uh, you know, cars that have died, giving them electricity. So, so the, what's the mathematics for Austin Energy now? And what, what did you learn from the 1820s and the 1880s and the 1890s when everything was electric in Austin? Well, uh, I wasn't around in the 1890s, full disclaimer, so I don't want to guess anyone else's age on this, this panel. You can take uh, my class. You can, you're a longhorn. You're, you're a longhorn. You, you, admit, you just say that you haven't read it. You know, uh, we got to, okay, go ahead. <laughs> play guitar during the class, I want to sign up. Uh, I want to take the class. So Austin Energy, let's talk a little about our history there. So we, um, Austin Energy was formed in 1895 by Austinites who wanted generated their own power. So we've been in this business model and space for a while. Uh, Austin had electrified trolleys up and down Congress. You can find some great photos of that uh, for, for decades. And so there is a history of electrification. Uh, yeah. the, the dam in Austin at the time was one of the largest renewable energy power plants in the world in the late 1800s, the, the dam on there. So, so there's definitely a culture and history of, I would say that Texas spirit in Austin, that sense of independence. So, so let's, let's look at the business models. And I think this is something where utilities, once again, have a really opportunity to evolve in that, so for example, public charging on the 1100 uh, level two charging ports is a fixed fee 
You can charge all you want in Austin, fill up all you want, $4.17 a month. That is, so utilities bemoan for decades how we sell biometric pricing, but the majority of our costs is fixed. And so they moan at that. So how we make ourselves whole is these line items, you know, demand charge, fixed charge, pass-throughs. Well, if ERCOT's going to charge us this, now this is your pass-through. And it makes, it makes the utility bill, quite frankly, can be confusing to a lot of people. The reason why we did 417 a month unlimited on the public charging for level two, it's 21 cents per minute plug in, plug out. And we can talk about that business model and why that works as well. So now we're acting more like, well, let's try something new. Let's Let's have people that can wrap their heads around and have some imagination. Wow, that's a gallon or two of gas. You know, it depends on where you are that month. And uh, let's see what happens. So we also, if you don't want to join, so it's like a gym membership. So if you go to the gym and, and you sign up for a year, so the 417 is a six month minimum contract. It's six months. And so that's like a gym membership. If you've gone to the gym for a day pass, they kind of hit you a little bit, like 14, 15 bucks for that day pass. Well, if you're not a member of the gym, it's $2 an hour for that 6KW, 6KWH basically an hour, 6KW. So that's pretty expensive. So you shake all that in and we are um, recouping just under 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And so it's, you'll have some sorts of bell curve. So there's a reason why McDonald's has a 99 cent value. If everyone just bought the 99 cent burger, they want to make man. But you come in and you buy fries and you do other things that makes McDonald's a very successful and profitable company. So at the end of the day, from we're talking business models at Austin Energy, I know now what a thousand vehicles do or what 10,000 vehicles do. Here's what 10,000 vehicles do. Every vehicle that I see driving around, I know the utility is going to recoup on average $385 per EV per year when I look at a thousand vehicles. Now, I might have one vehicle on the bell curve doing this and one vehicle on the bell curve doing this, but I know 385 per, per vehicle. So you're starting to talk about real money. So if you look at the ERCOT uh, system, it's called the LTSA, long-term system assessment of what they look at the growth of EVs. And if Austin Energy can maintain... 20% of the market share, we're about 23% right now. If we can maintain 20%, we have a projection by 2027, we're talking over 200 million per year of new revenue. And I would call this new revenue, since we talked earlier, it's not the same load. It is like spice on a rib. It's the most profitable revenue a utility can recoup right now because of what a thousand people do. 85% of all charging happening at home, existing infrastructure. 85% of all charging, majority of that is done at night. And over half of that is just plugging an outlet, zero extra cost infrastructure. So we have this huge machine called electric grid, billions and billions, trillions of dollars have been spent on it. And now we have this new business model that's coming in, naturally does a lot of off peak, has batteries, has a lot of great potential and just rolling onto our streets is 385. So that 385 number has been very important to, you know, my team, for example, we act more like a startup embedded in the utility. And a lot of times what the first thing startups look at, they want to capture market share. You know, what's the market cap? What's the market share? And then they figure out the, the business model. So when you look at our 30 programs and growing and the programs cover everything about everything with working with auto dealerships to grid integration, to equity programs, to fleet electrification, we just run the gamut. I can talk about any program utility is doing, we're probably doing it. Um, Cause we know if we remove barriers and we get those vehicles into our roads, the financial measure, now we have multiple measures, environment, financial, grid modernization, customer experience. EVs um, check off on all those, but since you asked business models, we'll talk about that. It's significant revenue to the utility. And, and I'll just end on this. Every, so if we were able to get 200 more million, let's say in raw revenue into the utility, that will equate to roughly 30 million or so more raw revenue back to our owners, the city that helps pay for parks and services and police or homelessness or what you want to, because we do a transfer general fund because we're owned by the city. So typically any given year, the city Austin Energy transfers about 120 million, give or take into the city fund every year as part of their fair investment by owning the utility. So that's out of 1.4 billion of revenue. 
we can add another 200 million and then in another five years, 500 million, another five years, 800 million. So then the city Austinites get their cut back. That's just more funding for the awesome city we live in. Question, uh, Paul, and that is, what about the question of equity? When we get a lot of EVs uh, feeding back into the grid, when they're losing this sort of lung function, uh, are people going to demand compensation? Because the more the battery is charged and downloads, the more it wears out. Aren't people going to say that, aren't you going to find yourself in essentially a revisited neck metering? as a problem in the utility industry. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested as being a, a city employee and working for Austin Energy, I'm always looking for win-win solutions. Um, so there's a few things. Um, one is probably the, the biggest bang for the buck is demand response, where there is no discharging back. It's just managing when they are sucking load at, at specific times can add 80% of the value off the top from a grid integration perspective. So that's why I said vehicle to home seems to be the low hanging fruit for more of a resiliency generator play rather than buying a gas generator and sitting in your garage, why not just have a F-150 that can do that and not have that extra expense and in infrastructure. Um, so, so, so one is we wanna look at that, but two, what we've also looked at is win-win scenarios. So we have a pilot program fully subscribed called EV360. So that is a shared win-win in that if you sign up for our EV360 program, you can have, you can charge all you want at home and all you want 24 seven in the public infrastructure for $30 a month with one little fine print. And the fine print is your kilowatt hour charge is 0.00 unless if you really want to charge during peak and that's defined what that time is, you know, certain summer not months, four to seven. If you really want to charge during that time, it's 41 cents a kilowatt hour. You go from zero to four. So as long as you set up your car or set up your infrastructure and it's easy to do, you set up once and you forget it. Don't charge during these times. So it's not like you're having to go out and charge at night. You just set it once and forget it unless you go in and override it you now have a fixed fee. So that's something where we want to encourage people, hey, don't charge on peak. And by doing so, you can have a very consistent flat uh, fuel bill for your reliable vehicle at home. So we're always looking at different kind of win-wins. If you started aggregating more capacity with fleets, I could see more interesting, you know, as we look at win-wins kind of more in the ERCOT market and, and where that could play in some of those kind of financial things. But just with demand response, you know, the reason why we, we financially win on demand response is that that lowers what's called our 4CP or transmission cost. And so we get a direct benefit because when that's calculated, they look at ERCOT as a whole and you're, you're paying the ERCOT transmission charge based on how much energy you needed on this hot summer afternoon. And 4CP stands for, it's four critical peaks during four different days during four summer months. So by us shaving that load, when ERCOT calculates, because we didn't use that power because we were able to shave it, that's how the utility makes money on encouraging people to charge off peak. Yeah, let me let me take a time out real quick and do my uh, plugging of the Eagle 360 Summit real quick. Hopefully you can see my screen. It's coming up. It's going to be amazing. Um, over 100 speakers, 400 companies. Uh, all kinds of phenomenal topics, smart cities, electric vehicles, mobility, and so on. Uh, these are some of the companies that have already agreed to speak. So it's kind of the who's who. I need to still add the Austin Energy logo in here somehow, working on that. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Texas State University for sponsoring our digital uh, summit and our digital roundtable. So Carl, uh, you know, clearly, you know, this is an exciting place to be at. And I love the numbers that you're sharing. I love the notion of $380 million of new revenues down the line when you have 100,000 vehicles or so, whatever it is. Um, a little less than that, I guess. Uh, tell me, what can we expect in the next three years. What's going to happen in the next three years? I mean, utilities tend to 
you know, not want to risk, uh, you know, waiting to, to see what happens. We, you talked a little bit about the charging standards. Maybe that's a big battle that is going on. But what's going to happen in the next three to five years? You know, it seems like the world is heading towards carbon neutral, right? Uh, every country, every company, we all want to be carbon neutral by 2030, 2040, 2050, soon, right? So I imagine the EVs are that's are going to get a benefit from that, and acceleration will be dramatic. So, so help us understand where do you think you're going to be in in the in the programs in EVs three five years from now? What's going to happen in Austin? Certainly. So you know, one thing when you look at our drivers as a utility is we report up to the city council and what are the drivers of city council and this, their strategic direction, SD23. And we fully expect city council to approve the new Austin community climate and equity plan. And so I, I co-chair the transportation electrification part of that. And one of the kind of interesting metrics, and I think it's an important metric, is vehicle miles traveled. So there's debate and I would really encourage people who are putting together community plans really look at VMT versus number of EVs. And so our goal, proposed goal, is to have 40% of all miles traveled in Austin to be on the electric platform by 2030. We're at 1% now. Traditionally wow. in EV sales, we've been seeing about a 30 to 40% year over year growth rate. Even during COVID, we're gonna see that amount of growth. But with the Ford F-150, we're gonna see another big spike, kind of like we did with the Tesla 3. Um, and the reason why VMT is important is a typical owner of a car will drive in Texas 12 to 14,000 miles a year. An electrified taxi or gig economy driver, TNC driver, transportation network company, Uber or Lyft, 60, 65,000 miles. A shared electric autonomous vehicle, so let's say an electric autonomous Lyft can do 100, 110,000 miles. So the strategy is let's focus on the resources that are capturing the most miles and we also don't want to be in comp competition with other working groups, for lack of a better word, where they're trying to reduce the number of vehicles and increase public transit. So VMT is just a percentage of up. So we still support reduction of vehicles and public transit, and all those other good things. It's not about putting more EVs on the road. It's really a capturing VMT uh, in a smart way and then focusing your resources on high mileage applications. So I continue to see us at a strong clip of 40% growth. Next year will be 60%, maybe even higher with the F-150 year over year. So we are in, you know, I won't say on fire because I already said I don't say the word on fire being I work with batteries. I almost want to say explosive growth. Maybe I can't even say that, but we will see amazing growth in the EV market. And the thing that I think that's important for folks to really think about, I know y'all y'all luminaries think about this all the time, is what's happening globally. A lot of times people think as well, we control, like you think you have control over these drivers. You have to look at the big announcements of the billions of investments from the May, what I call the sleeping giants. So whether it's the Ford F-150 Lightning, General Motors just announced this week, they're gonna have a competitor to the Ford F-150 Lightning, you know, goes on top of the Hummer and some other vehicles, you know, trucks and SUVs. You're seeing more major economies and countries making it legal to sell an internal combustion engine with a certain time frame. England just jumped onto that along with France and, and others. And then you look at what happened in China. You can't even think about what, because vehicles are as a global supply chain. And unless you consider, well, where's China going? You're really not considering what's happening in the US because we're part of a global ecosystem. So if you look at the global ecosystem, it, it, it's oh, the genie is out of the bottle. It, it's just done. So now it's time to um, just really try to see how we can innovate and embrace to maximize the opportunities, minimize the risks, and then really make sure we're, we're understanding the win-win. The so, you know, I represent the city of Austin and an electric utility. So my focus is in the win-win with that industry as well as our customers. But there's a, there's a lot of win-wins with industries and we talk about market caps and speculation and startups and really smart startups I work with, with inductive charging, 5G, you know, shared electric autonomous plan in Austin doesn't happen without 5G and those kind of high speed networks that can help drive autonomous driving. So you have all these technologies where everyone has a place to play. 
and I think grow and profit from, and let's go ahead and have this complete evolution of the transportation sector and, and, you know, just build back something amazing. Yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. It's obvious a lot of unintended consequences going on in the future. And you have to picture a society that's switching from a major technology that moved things. Um, uh, we saw that uh, what we learned about the space was that it takes a lot of combustion, uh, some fuel to go, go in space. <laughs> That's what we learned. But the electric uh, future is very, very exciting. I think that, that uh, like any new exciting technology, what's interesting is, will it work? And, and will the entrepreneurs keep up with the charging stations? Uh, what happens when you really pop, when you really plug a car in is very interesting you say this it's, it's like a, a regular plug but it's it's not like plugging a guitar in. it's a major download when you plug a vehicle in uh, if i drive from here to new orleans and i stop to get quote gas that's electric now how long do i have to wait to uh to fill up is it true now that we're having a technology where the vehicle could, could just roll across something and it's automatically charged so uh tesla is here. I mean, not the Tesla, the inventor at the turn of the century is turning over this grade, Nikola Tesla. So all of these things are very interesting and keep an eye on the business models because everything that you mentioned is also a business model, whether it's for the Ford 150, whether it's for people getting their own windmills, whether it's for situations where people try to think of a way where their house can be independently electric from the city of Boston. So we have a lot of interesting things to look at in the future going forward. Yeah, yeah. Llewellyn? Um, yeah, I want to change the subject just slightly. And I want to ask about, um, call about resilience, which is a word we hear a lot about. Uh, and it's rather squishy. Utilities are always working towards greater resilience. Uh, what's your interpretation of resilience? Is it Swift spring day, are there constraints? Can you define resilience? Can you refine resilience? Well, resilience to me is uh, for the electric grid, the ability to avoid uh, brownouts and or blackouts. And when you have outages, how quickly you recover. And so batteries can help with both of those. They can help with the avoidance as well as back. And, and one thing I, I, I like to remind folks, um, you know, we compare a lot of things during times of crisis to the perfect world of what we know. So those of us who lived through winter storm Uri, uh, Uri and the blackouts and catastrophe there were like, well, how are people charging their cars? Well, first of all is it was impossible to get gas here in Austin. One is gas pumps need electricity. So the few that had them ran out very quickly or you had a two hour wait and the trucks couldn't get there to fuel it. So with electric vehicles, we still had literally millions of plugs you could plug in and still start topping off your vehicle versus maybe one gas station. There was a rumor there was gas, but you're gonna have to wait three hours because the trucks can't roll. So I would say by its nature, having a distributed infrastructure of EV charging versus consolidated single points of failure called gas stations is I think just by its very nature, there's a lot more opportunity for resiliency and reliability. Then you start aggregating, you have formalized programs, you look at fleet. There's a lot of things you can start doing once you have that much battery load. And, and I would be amiss as a utility guy if I, I didn't end my thought on safety. In Texas, we had hundreds of people die because of carbon monoxide poisoning of people trying to stay warm in their garages with their internal combustion engine. We had thousands going to emergency rooms with carbon monoxide poisoning. People in EVs were going into, going into camp mode and just even just having just the warm heated seat and plugging your electronic devices because there's no tailpipe safely with the garage shut. And so you just have some natural things of doing nothing that I would say help during a time of crisis than what we, how we are used to doing things. It's funny. 
Those are great points. Those are great points. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Carl, we wish we could have you for more time. Unfortunately, you know, the show always ends at some point. And so we're delighted that you were here today and uh, share your insights and things that are going on in Austin. I think that unlimited public charging of EVs in Austin for $4.71. Is that right? Four seventeen. You're you're that's we're we're not four, stop four seventeen. Four seventeen. Oh and my I god, it's unlimited charging. And no, I, I would have my program manager get very upset. If you're interested in buying electric and you want to see all the vehicles in Austin that are available now, just not the type, but the color, how many miles, ev.austinenergy.com. Real-time inventory to include used EVs. I just looked up a, a low mileage used leaf for under $7,000, $6,800 on, on that market now, or you can see the latest, newest, and coolest. Uh, working with our auto dealerships with real-time inventory. So check out. Com. So that was ev, ev .com. That's right. Check out the wow. buyer's guide. Wow. 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 I also, I also want to congratulate you on this, on this program that is $30 for all you can eat at home or on the charging infrastructure. I think that's a brilliant program. $30 home and away. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, Andres, you definitely, uh, you know, helped with a lot of the thinking in my uh, early years at Austin Energy and how to make it work. So I, I have no doubt that has influenced our programs uh, continue to this day. So thank you. Well, it's great, great to see you, my friend. And I wish you well and we'll stay in touch. And I'll circle back about the Digital 360 Summit and figure it out to get you on stage. Let's do it. All right. Sell some Thank cars. you, guys. John, take us away. That's the music. program. After this pro I'm going down to the Greyhound station. I'm going to get a ticket to ride. I'm going to find that lady with two or three kids and sit down by her side. Ride till the sun comes up and down around about two or three times. Smoke a cigarette on the back seat. Try out the songs to the people I meet and get along with it all. Where the people say y'all and start over again. Change this world of me. Thank you. Well done, Johnny. Well done. Thank you very much, Paul. Well very, very interesting and informative. Okay. Thank you so much.